you everyone for particip participating in that poll. We'll have a couple more as we go tonight. But now that we are all acquainted, let's move on to our panel discussion. Much like the last session, we've designed tonight's questions to address the concerns of our college-aged alumni and students across the country who are either at the very beginning, in the middle of, or ending their college experience. And we're gonna start with the effects of COVID-19 for those earliest in their college experience, our rising or first year students. I'm sure that we've all read and our panelists have, certain written, have certainly written about and covered the impact of COVID-19 on a number of different industries. Our inbox is full of questions from students who are just beginning their college journeys and are concerned about what this means for them long-term. So our first question is this, is the tech industry recession proof or will the pandemic impact tech companies and tech hiring? Um, Claire, this question is right up your alley, so let's start with you. Yes, um, so I think this is a really interesting question right now because there's the question of is tech recession proof and then the COVID related recession I think is is sort of a different ball game. Um, at, you know, on one hand, I think that all companies, you know, at some point will be touched by the economic downturn, you know, tech companies in particular might lose the sorts of business deals, you know, they're providing tech services to other businesses. Um, businesses who are experiencing a cash crunch might rethink for their, you know, they're spending that money. But I think that, you know, something that COVID-19 has really sort of created is an acceleration of sort of the digital transformation that we're seeing. I mean, we're experiencing that right now. We're all talking on this Zoom call. Um, businesses are working remotely. People are going to school remotely. And it's been sort of a scramble to figure out how do we do that? How do we do that better? Um, and so I think that it's actually a really exciting opportunity for the tech space right now to start to think about how, you know, how can the industry drive that transformation, improve the way that we're working right now. Although I think things will start to sort of go back to normal. We're also going to see more and more businesses figuring out like, oh, can I be more flexible with my workforce? Can I let more people work from home? You know, what's a, what kinds of automation do we need in order to, you know, work more effectively in this new environment? Um, so I think that there'll be a lot of opportunities both for sort of the big tech companies to drive that kind of change, but also potentially in the startup space, you know, new ideas coming forward. forward. Um, how to address the kinds of problems that we're in. And so I think that, you know, even if the tech space is touched in this moment, that we may see it, you know, come out of the sort of economic downturn more quickly and, and jump on those kinds of opportunities. That makes sense. And I, I know that resonates with me, at least as a consumer of tech and all the tech that I'm using now that we're working from home. Courtney, is, are you seeing something similar? Does that resonate with you? Yeah, so just to piggyback off of what Claire said, um, I don't know if we can really say that tech is recession proof. I think we're seeing COVID-19 impact all industries and all companies in some way, shape or form. But I do think, um, as Claire said, it is causing a lot of companies to rethink how they go about hiring, to rethink how they go about operating their workforce. I mean, we heard, I can't remember if it was earlier this week or last week where Twitter you know, the CEO, Jack Dorsey, now said that employees will be able to work from home forever. Um, I read something where now Google will allow employees to work from home, you know, at least to the end of the year. And so I do think a lot of companies, if they haven't already before the pandemic, they will start to think about the value of having more flexibility um, and how they can work that into their workforce. And Courtney, as a follow-up, do you think hiring will stay steady as a result or... Um, are you expecting it to kind of dip in the short term? Um, I think it depends on what type of company and what industry. I mean, I know even in my own reporting, I've spoken to a lot of economists and they speak a lot about how even though we've seen, you know, cuts or, you know, layoffs in a lot of different industries, but we're also seeing like an increase in telehealth. And so what does that mean for people who work in technology? And so I do think that this is a time period where I think sometimes when you think of tech jobs, you do only think of like the Googles, the Facebooks, the Twitters, but I think this is a time for, you know, especially 
college students and those who are graduating to really open their eyes up to what other companies may have tech positions open. So is that a telehealth company? How can I be a benefit there? Is it a finance company that's looking for somebody in their tech department? I mean, literally every industry has a tech department. So I think this is really a time to just kind of like maybe open up your eyes to see what other industries um, my skill sets and experience could be useful for. That's such a great point. Thank you. It's what we see at Girls Who Code that tech is transforming every industry. And so it's not just big tech, it's financial services, it's consumer packaged goods companies, it's healthcare companies um, that are all becoming tech companies and doing tech hiring. All right, um, thank you for sharing. Our next question is gonna be ge geared towards assisting current college students whose academic experience has been completely redesigned in the last couple of weeks and then, as we know, um, next year as well. So the question is Scott Galloway, who is a marketing professor who predicted both Amazon's Whole Foods purchase and spoke about WeWork's IPO a month before its actually decline it actually declined, is now projecting that big tech companies will take over the higher education space. And we've seen this model before in the past, where tech giants have teamed up with elite universities like MIT and Google, Microsoft and Berkeley, Harvard and Facebook. So our poll question for audience members, uh, we're going to ask you, would you be interested in attending a college or university that partners with tech companies? And like last time, you'll have 30 seconds to respond. And while we wait for responses, Claire and Courtney, our question for you is going to be, are you seeing a rise in industry and university partnerships? And what opportunities do these collaborations present for current students or matriculating students? I'm just going to wait a minute to see the poll responses. Wow, so an overwhelming 96% of you said yes, you would be interested. Thanks so much for your candor. That's a really interesting place to start our conversation. Um, so Courtney, I'd like to start with you this time. What are your thoughts on whether we're gonna see a rise in these types of partnerships and, and what they mean for students? Yeah, so um, I do hope that we see a rise in these type of partnerships. I won't be surprised um, if we do, especially considering the time period that we're in. Um, I do, I have seen like a lot of companies are now looking for virtual interns. And so I do feel like if they already have that relationship with different universities and they may not, you know, if there isn't this big college fair, but they already have a relationship with say, for instance, you know, the technology department at Yale or the technology department at uh, Georgia State University. Um, this will really help them to stream that pipeline of, hey, we're looking for interns and we're looking for entry level employees, let's partner with this university and see who they have in the pipeline. Um, I think programs like that are super important because I think a lot of times, sometimes um, in the tech industry, you hear about people from the same universities getting the same opportunities. And so I do think that these type of partnerships allow companies to broaden their horizon when they're looking at talent and it allows um, students who are graduating to have access to mentorship, to have access to sponsorship, which is super important from the start of your career to the end of your career. And so I do hope that we do see an influx of these um, partnerships between universities and, and big companies. And I think your, your point about how do we make sure that we're bringing those opportunities, not just to our very elite schools, but to community colleges, to HBCUs, to state colleges, where the vast majority of our students are going is so important. Um, and hopefully something that, that tech companies um, will be interested in. Claire, what are your thoughts? Do you, is this something that you see that could kind of further democratize access to education? Is it something that's going to remain among the elite schools? And, and what does it mean for students? Yeah, I think um, sort of along the lines of what Courtney was saying, I also hope that we see more of these kinds of partnerships. I think something that this moment in time has, um, again, sort of accelerated is 
or, or brought to light is how valuable science is and whether it's computer science, whether it's other types of science, um, you know, how, how important it is to be able to move quickly when problems arise to address those things. And I think a lot of times computer science is a valuable way of doing that. Tech is a valuable way of doing that. Um, you know, I think of IBM and the, the cloud computing, sorry, excuse me, the, the supercomputing consortium that they created to help develop vaccines and treatments for coronavirus. I think that, um, you know, another way, great way of accelerating the science that we do is to partner with these universities, whether it be those, you know, top universities that we think of or, you know, big state universities, community colleges, like you said, I think um, that those that those partnerships can be really valuable in sort of moving science forward and addressing the kinds of problems that we're seeing today. Um, and I would agree with you. I think that it's important that that, again, we see these kinds of partnerships at all kinds of universities. And I would encourage students to look at, you know, is it not just the big, you know, is does Google have a partnership with my university, but what kinds of companies in my local area are wanting to be involved with my university and whether, you know, you take the class that gets you into that lab or not. Um, if, if a company is on campus and wanting to be involved with students, that's an opportunity to reach out and say, you know, you know, what kinds of opportunities are available to your company or can I sit down and have an informational interview with you, especially while everybody's sitting at home right now. I think it's a good time to try and, you know, ask for networking, ask for advice. And so, yeah, I do hope we see more of those kinds of partnerships. Claire, you mentioned some really kind of practical things that um, could benefit students as a result of these partnerships. Can you expand on that? A little bit more both what um, could potentially be available available on campus and as well off campus at the companies themselves. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, again, like you, you may be able to get into a lab and, and do some research or work with an executive, maybe there's an executive from a company that's running a lab or partnering with a professor, I think a lot of times, um, you know, professors that work at universities are a good place to start a lot, a lot of times those folks are still really connected within the industry. Um, and so I think it's a good, you know, it's a good place to start with networking. I think that can be a really scary word sometimes or, you know, like sounds, sounds a little, I, I don't know, to me it always is a little scary. Um, and so I think that I think that that's a really good place to start in terms of making connections with people in the industry. It can feel a little less scary if you already have that connection of, oh, we're both connected to this university. And so, you know, can I take you with it right now? You can't take anybody for coffee, but can I sit down and have an informational interview? <laughs> Or, um, you know, can I ask your advice on what books by industry leaders I should be reading right now as I'm, as I'm hoping to get into the industry? I think those are really, really cool opportunities that having a company connected to a university can provide. Great, thank you for that. I, I think that practical advice is really useful too as we think about these bigger questions. So now we are gonna to turn to um, what next steps our soon-to-be graduates should be thinking about and taking. And as we see companies restructure in response to COVID and invest more in things like AI and automation, it seems like technology is more vital than ever. And we know this impacts the job market and it will lead to a shift in the type of candidates that employers will be looking for. So what roles and skill sets are currently in highest demand in tech and kind of the adjacent industries like FinTech or health tech? Courtney, as you're um, our careers expert, I would love to start with you. What have you seen since the onset of COVID-19? Um, so yeah, so just in some of my reporting and interviewing, interviewing and talking to different people, like I mentioned earlier, um, especially considering the time period that we're in, um, the telehealth industry is definitely hiring a lot. Um, but beyond that, I think just in terms of the skills that employers are looking for, especially now where for the time being, there isn't a lot of face-to-face -face interaction. So they really are looking for people who have like amazing verbal and written communication skills. And I think that's across any industry because a lot of times, especially during this time period, you're reaching out to people over email. You're having a virtual phone interview with that internship. If you are doing a virtual internship, you're speaking to your boss or your mentor, or whoever, over Skype or over Zoom. And so people are really want to make sure that we have young people come in who can communicate effectively. Um, as well as like I'm seeing a lot of employers talking about emotional intelligence and being able to like really be able to 
manage certain issues as they arise and like be able to like emotionally communicate how you're getting through it, how you're managing it. Um, I think this is a crazy time period for all of us. Um, but I do think that written and um, verbal communication is just super important. I think that those are two skills that regardless of the time period, they're going to always be needed. I think regardless of the industry, um, regardless of what level you're in, employers are always looking for that. Um, and yeah, and like I said, telehealth is like the number one industry that comes to mind um, right now. And then also, you know, like I said, in, in finance, I was looking um, online the other day and I see how like Bank of America, they have open positions um, in various different departments. And even with that, with their internship program, they're still saying they're going to pay their interns for the full 10 weeks of the internship program. And so I think that's that's a bright spot um, in the midst of what's going on when you do hear that some companies are taking back their internships. I think now is a good time to look at what companies aren't and to see how you can fit your foot in the door there and what departments are looking for interns or entry level positions. Thank you for that, Courtney. Are you seeing that companies want specific majors or minors or are they mo more focused on skills like writing and communication, like you said? Um, I think the good thing is they're more focused on skills. Um, I think we hear all the time about how some people may have a degree in a certain career field and then when they graduate, they go in and pursue a career in a completely different field. Um, and so I think the good thing is like a lot of companies are open to saying like, okay, even though we might, we might be a finance company, but we aren't only looking at people with an accounting degree. We aren't only looking at people who majored in economics. Like we're open to people who majored in whatever subject, but as long as they have the skills that we're looking for, as long as they have like the determination that we're looking for and they can prove that like they can actually get the job done, they can help us to solve problems. They can prove that they can be a value to our company. I think really it's more so about the skills that you bring to the table and how you communicate those skills um, is super important. That's great to hear. Claire, have you seen something similar? Yeah, I think, um, I think that Courtney made a lot of good points about those soft skills that are really important. I think that right now companies are looking for people who are flexible and adaptable because of this really weird situation. And so I think that right now could be a really good time to, to demonstrate that you're able to do that, you know, whether it's that you have a virtual internship. And so you need to be even better about sort of keeping track of still connecting with people who you're working with, or, you know, maybe, maybe the internship situation is more challenging. And so you do some freelance work, you know, that sort of thing. I think that, that being able to prove that you, you know, don't only need to work in, in one way and sit in a desk and do your work there. I think that right now is, is, obviously more important than ever. Um, I think too, you know, maybe kind of an exciting thing about the time that we're in is that companies of all kinds, like we've talked about, are looking for, to be able to transform and are looking for solutions and nobody really knows what the right answer is. And I think that means that the right answer could come from anybody. It doesn't need to be the leadership in the company who says, you know, I have an idea about how we can do things. I think that you know, everybody here, everybody in this program has been willing to step out and put themselves maybe in a, in a situation that's slightly less comfortable than, than they might like. And so I think, you know, if you have an idea, if you're willing to be a little bit creative um, and speak up about that, it's a good time to kind of be brave and raise your hand and be willing to try things or put yourself out there a little bit. Um, I think, I think that, you know, is, is hopefully sort of a hopeful thing about this moment that we're in. Um, and then again, I think as far as sort of specific industry trends, again, the sort of AI, automation, telehealth, obviously is a great example of that. Um, you know, all companies will be looking to make this digital transformation. So maybe being creative in thinking about your career path and not just thinking about the big tech giants, but what are some other smaller companies that might be looking to make this transition and need the, the skills and the help that you could provide in, in doing that? I think um, that's a good place to look. That's great, thank you. And I, I love that you use the word bravery, which is one of our core values at Girls Who Code and something that we talk a lot about and teach in our programs. Um, we see that girls are going to need to be open to raising their hands, even when they're not sure, because that's what boys are doing. Um, and it's interesting to hear that, particularly in this time of a, of a lot of uncertainty, that you think that applies um, doubly in the workforce as well. So thank you, Claire and Courtney, for an amazing panel discussion. We are going to now transition into the Q&A portion of our evening. 
we've selected questions from our Girls Who Code alumni and community who are viewing this conversation and would like further guidance about navigating the tech industry during this pandemic. Um, we've selected three. We, um, I heard before the call that we got 150. Um, so hopefully we addressed some of those already. Um, and please keep asking questions in the chat. Our team is there to answer them as well. The first question comes from Michelle J. Her question is, globally, most industries are implementing work from home policies due to this epidemic. Will companies be more susceptible to accepting applications from international candidates? Courtney, this was something that you mentioned um, in your response, I think, to our first question about uh, work from home and more flexibility. Can you expand on what you think um, companies are going to be open to in terms of where they're willing to hire from? Yeah, so I do think that will be one of the beauties of greater flexibility and the option to work from home is that not only will companies be able to tap into a greater network of talent, but employees will also be able to tap into companies who may not be per se located in their particular city. Um, I know right now, even if you look just within the U.S., you, you know, especially when you're looking at tech, you automatically think of like the New York and the San Francisco and maybe like the Austin, but those are places where everyone can't live, whether it's, you know, it's for various reasons, but those are also like expensive cities. And so I do think the benefit of if more companies are open to a remote workforce is that they will be looking to hire people um, regardless of location. As long as you have the skill sets that we're looking for, then we're looking to talk to you. I think also one benefit is if companies do already have an international presence, which a lot of big companies do, I think they may be open to, um, like I said, even expanding that internationally in terms of, you know, when they're looking for different positions. Well, hey, if we already have a small team in London, then I don't see any harm in hiring an entry-level person remotely there or intern remotely there to work there um, and communicate with all of us. Um, so I do think that is the benefit, and I think it'll be beneficial for both employers and employees. It just expands the network um, of the talent that's coming in and providing you know, people who are looking for jobs with more opportunities to look for jobs outside of their one particular area. Thanks for that answer, Courtney. Claire, um, I'm curious how you, how you would respond to this question. Yeah, I think, um, I think again, this is going to be something that, you know, hopefully will be a benefit coming out of this is this increased flexibility. Um, and I also think it's sort of an opportunity maybe to to differentiate yourself if you live in a place that's not, you know, like Courtney mentioned, one of the big tech hubs, San Francisco, the New York, um, you know, the, the customers that tech companies serve are not just on the coasts. And so being able to say, you know, I'm someone who understands a different place and what the people in a different place need and how they interact with technology in a way that, that maybe it's different. I think that that being able to bring that outside perspective that, you know, those places, those tech hubs can be kind of insular, kind of a bubble. Um, and so I think that, yeah, being able to say, I have a different perspective and that's really an asset. Um, and now it's easy for you to hire me because you figured out your work remote situation. Um, I think hopefully that will be something positive that comes out of this whole situation. Thank you, Claire. And I guess a follow-up question to both of you. Are there things that you think international candidates could do um, to differentiate themselves from U.S. candidates? Uh, Claire, you offered um, the kind of perspective of, of being outside the U.S. Are there other types of things that you think would be beneficial for international candidates applying for what were, used to be U.S.-based jobs? Yeah, I mean, I think a trend that we're seeing in the tech industry is, you know, the attempt to move into international markets, emerging markets, um, and so many of the ways that, that again, those people in different markets interact with technology is different. And so having that, you know, I think, um, you know, the way that people use money and a lot of the tech companies are trying to get into, get into e-commerce, get into the fintech space. So saying I have an understanding of how people in my country, in my community use money, would use digital technology in that way. Um, telehealth, I think, is another example, just, you know, being able to think about and, and really sort of explain that that outside perspective that you bring being from a different place. Um, that's certainly something that tech companies are, are looking to do. Um, so I think that that could be really valuable. 
Courtney, I see you nodding. Do you have anything to add? Um, no, yeah, I just completely ag agree with Claire. I think, um, as she said, you know, with, when a lot of tech companies, if they're looking to go to tap into international marketplaces, it's always good if, you know, you can come to the table and you're willing to be vocal about, hey, I know what our consumers want in this particular area. I know, and, and a lot of times too, there's different workplace cultures. And so companies want to be able to s smoothly transition into that with someone who's right there and who's on the ground. And so I think if you can bring that to a company, I think that really um, sets you apart. And to be honest, it also helps save the company money because then they don't have to worry about someone in state that they're having to travel and, and worry about relocation. And you're right there and you can tell them firsthand, hey, this is what consumers want here. Hey, this is what may work here. It may not work where you are, but this is what works here. And I think that that could be really valuable to a company. Thanks, Courtney. And yes, I was just reading an article this morning about um, what all what work from home means for commercial real estate and companies that have invested in these massive office towers or campuses that may no longer need them anymore. So it is really interesting to see these big systemic shifts that are gonna be happening or already happening. Our next question is from Radhika A. As the hiring environment changes due to COVID, are there any emerging or niche fields that will satisfy needs for technology employers? Courtney, Claire, up to you who, who wants to take this first. Um, so yeah, I think as we both mentioned earlier, um, and I know we've said it multiple times, but telehealth, because that, that, that isn't going anywhere anytime soon. Um, Claire mentioned a lot about um, AI and automation. Um, and I think just in general, this has really, this time period has forced a lot of companies if they didn't already have a digital presence, if they didn't already take um, the need for them to be digital seriously, I think this time period is forcing them to, which means I think with that is going to come at increase in them realizing like, oh, hey, actually we do need a software engineer. Hey, actually we do need more people in our tech program to help us with these tech issues that we're having. And so I do think that this will force a lot of companies to really invest in like their digital presence, which in turn will lead them to needing to hire more people to help them make that transition to tech. Claire, I'm wondering if, since we've talked a lot about these kind of industries that are rising in the, in the wake of COVID that will need digital skills even more, I'm wondering if you have some practical tips about where you can find these jobs um, and places to look for people who are searching for um, some in these more particular niches. Yeah, I think um, I was thinking a little bit about this and, and you know, it, it's almost like being a college senior, being somebody who's hunting for a job, you're kind of news gathering about your, your industry. And so I was thinking about how I sort of look for trends, um, you know, try to follow these kinds of things. I think, um, you know, following industry leaders on LinkedIn or on Twitter, a lot of times, you know, maybe they're not saying, hey, I need somebody who could do X because we're trying to take our company in this direction. But maybe they're saying, oh, I'm really excited about this new opportunity for our company or this new direction or we're trying something new. And, and that's sort of a hint like, oh, you know, they're going to need people who know how to do that kind of thing move in that kind of direction. Um, so I think that's one really great way. Again, I think, you know, going to going to mentors, going to professors and saying, what are you most excited about, about, you know, where where tech is going right now, what what this whole thing is going to, to change. I think that, you know, getting the getting the discussion started that way, you know, what are you excited about? What what, you know, is the most important thing for your company right now? Um, I think that that's sort of a good way to get into having those kinds of conversations with people that might lead to an internship or a job or, you know, just a, you know, a new way of thinking about your career path. That's a great point about using your professors as a resource um, and even former professors, if your, your school has already ended, um, I'm sure they kind of have their fingers on the pulse of what's happening right now in their industries and are wanting to point graduates in the right direction. Courtney, are there any tips that um, you would provide for how to find these jobs? Um, yeah, so I still would say rely on your Career Resource Center. Um, send them an email and ask them where certain alumni are working at and if they're willing to connect with you. I would also say um, there are various different platforms out there. Like I know Handshake is one platform where they 
spotlight a lot of um, career opportunities. And I was just looking on their site the other day and they have positions um, on there of companies like Amazon and Facebook and Apple that, who are looking for in, entry level positions as well as internships. Um, there's also a new platform that I just found out about and it's literally called Hiring 2020. And that's also their Twitter name. And they're also specifically spotlighting um, companies that are looking for interns as well as entry level positions um, for the class of 2020. And on there, like I said, that's where I found out about the Bank of America position and how they're still looking for interns and they're looking to still pay them for the 10, week, 10 weeks that they're um, completing their internship. And so there are a couple of different platforms out there. Um, I think this is a time period where social media is really your friend. And so I think too, because right now, you know, we aren't able to have that face-to-face -face interaction at career fairs or career centers. So I think it's super important to have like a list of the top people in your industry, or even if you have a particular company that's maybe like your goal company, figure out some of the people who work there, add them on LinkedIn, um, maybe even follow them on social media. A lot of events now that were supposed to take place in person, they're now happening virtually. And I think that's a benefit because now if say for instance, the event was supposed to take place in New York, and you're not based in New York. If it's a virtual event, then you can attend it now. And then that could be another way to connect with someone who otherwise, you know, you may not have been able to connect with um, unless you were in their city. That's a great point about kind of the silver lining of this and um, some great resources for our viewers to check out. Claire, I, I saw just you... one other thought. Yeah. <laughs> um, that, that sort of came up while I was listening to Courtney. Um, and I, I, so I've read this and one of my CNN colleagues um, had a piece in the last week or so about, um, you know, internship hunting right now. And I hope this hasn't happened to anyone, but one of the things that was suggested there was if your internship has been canceled um, or, you know, postponed or something weird has happened there, um, to reach out to the person who you were talking with, who you got hired by um, and say, is there, you know, a lot of times companies that hire interns have specific projects they want interns to work on. So, so asking like, is there any project that still needs to get done? Is there any work that still needs to get done? Um, that might get you a freelance gig or, you know, some sort of, some sort of project that you could put on a resume down the line. Um, I think I just, you know, being creative in that way about, you know, it's, it, it might be more challenging this summer in the coming months, but um, who can you ask to, to get a project, to get uh, an, an informational interview? It's just something that, that you can talk about then later down the road. You know, there was this challenging time in my career, but here's what I did with it. That's a great point. Thank you for sharing that. All right, our last question comes from our former Girls Who Code alumni team intern, Camille D. She asks, landing a job or internship at a huge tech company is going to be more competitive than ever with hiring freezes, offers being rescinded, Claire, as you just mentioned, and in-person recruitment events being canceled. How likely is it that companies will roll out new career opportunities at the end of the summer, like they've done in the past? Claire, do you want to start? Sure. Um, yeah, so again, I think it's, you know, obviously it's such an uncertain and tricky time, so it's kind of hard to know. I think, um, again, especially by the end of the summer, maybe this, you know, this opportunity that we've talked about, the tech companies really kind of jumping on this, this digital transformation moment that we're seeing, I think that, you know, hopefully a couple of months down the line, those opportunities start to open up, the companies start to, you know, they have a little bit more of a sense of at least where the world is going, where the market is going, that kind of thing. Um, so I'm hopeful that we'll see those opportunities start to pop up a bit more. Um, again, I think that, that, you know, looking for, you know, looking beyond those big tech companies and thinking, you know, maybe about being creative about the career path that you saw yourself taking, you know, maybe there's an opportunity to volunteer with a nonprofit that, that needs help with that digital transformation. Um, again, I think like looking at freelancing opportunities is a, is a good option. But I think in a lot of cases, especially the big tech companies might take the opportunity to scoop up some talent that, you know, maybe startups are having a smaller, a harder time, um, you know, certainly we've seen layoffs and hiring freezes. And so, so it could also be that the big tech companies take the opportunity to hire more. Um, they have the resources to do that. And so, um, yeah, I would say don't, don't lose hope. <laughs> That's great to hear. And, and that makes a lot of sense. Courtney, I, I'd love to ask as a follow-up question, 
how or to what extent are companies proactively addressing diversity in their hiring, particularly as they think about having rescinded offers or delaying some of their hiring later in the summer or year? Um, well, I can really only speak to what I hope companies are doing, um, because like I said, I know this is uncertain time for everyone, but I do hope that companies um, during this time period that are being mindful of, especially if they did already have a group of interns who they were hoping to onboard, if they did have to resend those offers, I hope when they do pick back up, I hope they're keeping in mind who they're looking to onboard, um, what schools are they coming from, so they're making sure that these aren't students who are coming from the same schools, these aren't students who are coming from the same regions, these are students who are racially diverse, gender diverse, um, I hope those are at top of mind um, when they are looking to pick back up with hiring. Um, just kind of a piggyback off of Claire, I do think that um, a lot of the big tech companies, because of the money that they do have, I do think they have more resources to pivot quickly. And so I do hope that, you know, I won't be surprised if, you know, some of these internships may become virtual internships. I think be open to that and what that will look like. But I do hope that um, companies keep diversity and inclusion at top of mind. So you can't just bring on diverse candidates and then, you you know, and that's done. You have to also make sure that you have programs in place um, for them to feel included so that they don't get on board and feel isolated. So I do hope that companies will, if they have had to put a halt on hiring or a halt on internships, that when they do pick back up, they will keep in mind, who are we bringing on board? What backgrounds are they coming from? What schools are they coming from? What experiences are they bringing to the table? Um, so that, that way they know that they're getting that best group of incoming talent um, to, to foster and to be the next generation of leaders. Thanks for that, Courtney. And uh, Girls Who Code, we very much believe and hope for that as well. Claire, are you seeing any trends um, when it comes to companies proactively addressing diversity in their hiring right now? Um, yeah, so I think this is, um, this is perhaps a little bit outside of my, um, you know, realm of coverage, but I do think, um, like Courtney said, that that just becomes even more important as we think about solving new kinds of problems, um, thinking about, you know, how different kinds of people interact with technology differently, having a range of perspectives in your workplace and, and making a workplace that is open to hearing all of those different voices and taking suggestions from all of those different voices. I think that tech companies in particular trying to serve everybody can only benefit from, from having a range of types of people, ages of people in the room and, and really listening to all of those people. Yes, we, we really agree. And I think particularly in times of crisis, we need a diverse range of voices around the table or we're not going to solve these really tough problems in front of us. So um, that is the end of our discussion. I hope you all enjoyed our time together tonight as much as I did. And if you did, um, please let us know right now by completing a one minute survey to give us feedback on tonight's conversation. Um, you'll, all you have to do is pull out your phone, go to the camera, hover your ca camera over the QR code that's now on the screen and complete the survey. We really appreciate and take any and all feedback very seriously. So thank you for contributing. And on behalf of Girls Who Code, I wanna thank our panelists, Claire and Courtney, for joining us and sharing your wisdom this evening. And please uh, be sure to follow us uh, at Girls Who Code on social media for more uh, Girls Who Code talks. And we hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.